Hello guys and welcome to TGN the Game Nerd the Show I talk about roleplay games and today we're going to be playing Zero Escape, 9 hours, 9 persons, 9 doors. In the last episode, if you don't remember, we went ahead and we made our way through the 8 door and we talked a bit more with Lotus and Clover. We didn't really get full conversations with them last time. And in this episode, now making our way out of the 8 door, we move towards the third set of... Uh, what are they called? Numbered doors, that's the word. So we're just kind of moving toward that and hoping to see if we can get any new dialogue. Okay, moving our way back through. Like I said, we gotta get through the... get to the third set of numbered doors. Uh, oh, is there new dialogue here? Because we went through the eight door before. I wonder what this could be. The key? Ain't that what I just said? I'm talking about the Jupiter key. We found it in the... Operating room. Here. Seven tossed something small metallic toward Junpei. He caught it and found the object was a key. On it, something had engraved on a symbol similar to a four. He looked over at Jun, who nodded back. It had to be the Jupiter symbol. I'm gonna let you hold on to that, all right. Yeah, I got it. Well, I've got something for you, too, then. Here. It's the Saturn key card. We found it in the kitchen. I might lose it. It's probably better if you hold on to it. That way it won't be my fault if it gets lost. And with that, she pressed it into Junpei's hand. He felt slightly less than honored. As a group, they now had three keys that had not been used. The Earth key, which had been found in the laboratory. The Jupiter key, which Seven had just hap handed to Junpei. The Saturn key card, which Lotus had just handed to Junpei. I wonder what was different there. Because I get the idea that we went with Seven this time through the first door and then Lotus the second time through the second set of doors. But, I'm, and I'm sure something changed there, but I'm just not sure what it was. There have been a couple of times where we've been skipping through and I've just been like, what's the difference here? Because it looks like pretty much the same dialogue as before, but it must have some sort of slight change to it. There's a name for that. There's something out there where you have, like, the feeling that something has changed, but you can't put your finger on it. And some sort of, like, fear, I think. There's something or other, some sort of psychological thing. Uh, that does sound like some sort of psychological, like, phenomena or something like that. Anyways, now this is the point where we learn that Snake has unfortunately died. We make our way through, and Seven, uh, this time around, we know that Seven had also placed those uh, things in uh, the door for the rooms uh, behind the five doors, so we know that him uh, placing stuff in place so the doors don't close or lock uh, is something that he's actually been doing a lot around the ship, at least, or at least in uh, a couple of places. So now they're arguing back and forth about, uh, you know, Zero. Who's Zero? Is he on the ship? Is he one of us? They completely discount Junpei's argument because he accidentally slips up once. I hope you guys are thinking at home now about, like, who's doing certain things about the ship. Because right now at this point in the game, we have two mysteries at this point. We have... The mystery of who Zero is, of course, and we also have the mystery of who is going around and killing a bunch of people. Because we had the sub-ending, and, uh, and that was pretty crazy. And we also have the question of who started killing people in the knife ending, because uh, we never really got an answer to that. It was going through door six. We're never going to get the option to go through door two, but it's some pretty basic dialogue. Uh, not too much changes. So door six it is. And so now once you've gone through doors five, eight, and six, you are on the path to uh, getting the ending that we are going for. Previous endings, uh, you get by going through... Uh, you get the axe ending by going through door one. You get the... Knife ending by going through door 6, and the uh, sub ending by going through door 2, but that changes uh, if you go on the paths for the 
uh, like two big endings. So the true ending or the ending that we're going for right now. Anyways, June's having her fever again, uh, just like she did last time we walked in here. And we're at the steam engine room once more. Uh, one of my least favorite things that people do on the internet, I've never I've ranted about people's on the internet before, but one of my least favorite things that people do on the internet is they'll like take someone's just opinion on something and say that it's biased. Actually, are we gonna get some new dialogue here? With that, he turned and walked away from the winch. Junpei Nace followed him. You know, speaking of experiments, Santa suddenly stopped. There was this experiment some scientists did with rats. First, they took a square seat-shaped tank and filled it with enough water that the rats could drown. The tank had two exits, A and B. Exit A is pitch black, so dark even a rat can't see anything. Exit B, however, is electrified, which means the rat can't leave through it. So what would a rat do if it was put in this situation? Which exit would the rat choose? There was a moment of silence after Santa posed the question, and then Ace responded. B, of course. The rat has no way of knowing the exit B is electrified. Exactly. The rat goes to exit B. Of course, like I said, it's electrified, which means the rat can't get out that way. So after a lot of trial and error, the rat finally finds exit A. Hmm, I can't say that's very interesting, or relevant. It's simply the story of a laboratory experiment. You're right, it isn't very interesting. Yet. Hmm? The scientists repeated this experiment over and over, using hundreds of different rats over several generations. This produced some surprising results. With each generation of rats, they took less time to find the correct exit. Eventually, a rat was put in the tank who instantly chose exit A without even attempting to go to exit B. But even that wasn't the most impressive thing. The same experiment was conducted in another laboratory far from the original one with the same results. No, on second thought, this, the results weren't really the same. The rats in the second experiment began the trials with a significantly faster times than the first rats in the initial experiment. These rats were not related to the rats used in the first experiment and had never even come in contact with them. And yet, they all easily found their way to exit A as though they already knew. What did it mean? Are you suggesting something like telepathy? They were passing information to one another through some undetectable medium? Ace looked skeptical. Santa snorted at him. How the hell would I know? I'm not any kind of scientist and I don't know what made him do that. But I do know that the story's true, and if you've got another explanation, I'm sure I'd love to hear it. Come on, let's get going. There's still a lot we haven't checked out. But we've got to get the hell out of here before June passes out. Without waiting for a response, he turned around and started walking. Junpei, however, wasn't quite ready to leave the topic alone. Hey, wait. There's something I want to ask you. Santa stopped and turned around. Why did they use that tank for the experiment? Huh? Well, I mean, it seems like you could conduct the same experiment without the water. They could have just used a dry box, you know? If they needed to motivate the rats to escape, they could have, I don't know, put some bait by exit B or something. I mean, do they really have to make it so the rats can drown? Santa gave a grim bark of a laugh. You know the word emergency comes from the same root word as, the, as emerge? You ever think about that? Well, an emergency is something urgent often something dangerous, and to emerge means to sort of come out, or appear, or rise out of something else. So what's going to emerge in an emergency? Inspiration. Inspiration? Yeah, think about it. When the chips are down, either you crack or your mind focuses and pulls up what you need. So in an emergency, your real potential emerges? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's why the rats had to drown. They had to be in danger. There had to be an emergency for inspiration to emerge. Junpei suddenly felt cold. The back of his head was aching, and his stomach felt strange. Ooh. So we're sort of... You're seeing some returning themes in this game. Something that uh, we've seen 
again and again, uh, mentions of telepathy and a field that you can't see. I went the wrong way. Ignore me. But we're seeing those same themes pop up over and over. We've got Lotus's test with the Funyurinpa. We had... What was it after that? We had, you know, Lotus's explanation of how the brain works in the laboratory. And now we've got this. So we're seeing this idea return again and again. So just keep it in mind. Think about it for a little bit. But yeah, one thing that I don't like is when people refer to other people's opinions as biased. Like, yeah, that's the point of an opinion, you know? Like, people will say, you only like this thing because you're biased or you're nostalgia blind. It's like, it's my opinion. Who cares? I'm not trying to say that this is, like, factually the best thing ever. Because, as I've said before in probably, like, a different LP, you know, there's no such thing as, you know, a piece of media being factually good or something like that. So just... The point of an opinion is to have something distinct to you, something distinct to your experiences and what you feel. So... If they're biased with their opinion on something, uh, then that's just... Like, yeah, that's the point, you know? It's weird to explain because... You know, it seems obvious in my brain, so when I say it out loud, I kind of sound weird. But anyway. So now we get to this point. Before, Santa talked about the tale of the two Santas, the black Santa and the white Santa. And how uh, the white Santa, after killing the black Santa, was stained red with, was stained red with the black Santa's blood. And that's why Santa Claus is red. But now we're getting something different. Uh, before this, he talked about uh, his younger sister. Uh, so he said, uh, It's a photo of my sister. Yeah, kid was as cute as a button. I skip past June being weird. He simply turned... Santa didn't smile or laugh. He simply turned back to his picture and spoke. I was her Santa Claus. A sudden revelation had took Junpei by surprise. He had no idea what Santa meant. He glanced at June, who shook her head. She didn't know either. We didn't have parents. They bought it in an accident when we were still kids. So I had to be like her dad. And that meant I bought her Christmas presents every year. On Christmas Eve, I'd leave the present next to her pillow. And the next morning, she'd come running into my room with his big smile. Look, look. Santa left me a present. Santa got me that doll I really wanted. I'm so glad that he got the letter I wrote. I was the one who told her to write those letters. I'd say, write down something you want and mail it to Santa. The address I gave her was somewhere in Northern Europe that doesn't exist. Anyway, she'd write the letter and stamp it and send it out. And then a few days later, it'd show up back in our mailbox marked, Address Unknown. I'd open the letters before she'd figured out they'd, they'd been sent back. Once I had the letter, I'd go around to a couple stores with some money I'd saved up over the year and buy her the stuff she'd asked for. It took a lot of saving, but I managed to buy her presents every year. Junpei was silent. He couldn't... he could think of nothing to say. June looked down, uncomfortable. The wall next to him suddenly groaned. Either he hadn't heard the sound or didn't care. Santa kept talking. But one year, her letter was different. She didn't write a list of toys she wanted or anything like that. Instead, she said, I don't want any presents this year. Instead, I want you to make my wish come true. My wish is that we'll be happy like this for a really, really long time. But I couldn't make that wish come true. Some Santa I am. Santa looked sad. Junpei had never seen him like look sad before. He wasn't sure he liked it. 
Junpei decided it was probably best not to ask Santa any more questions. But... What... happened? Jun glanced up at Santa quickly as she spoke. He answered, but only with an effort. She died. She was killed. Nine years ago. There was nothing Junpei could say. His heart felt like a great lump of lead. Jun bit her lip and looked away. Her face was pale. Alright. Let's go. Santa stood up suddenly, his downcast demeanor gone. We get a much darker story that time. A very, uh, it's a story that really touches your heart. And I think gives Santa a lot of great characterization and just puts a lot of, I don't know, a lot into his character. Speaking of Santa, hey. Uh, anyway, we're back in this room. Want to go ahead and get all of the headshots this time. And I think we do get something a bit different. But yeah, that's probably one of my favorite scenes in the game. Once you've gotten all nine cards, go ahead and investigate this once more. We skip through. And just then, Junpei heard a noise. He spun around just in time to see Jun collapse in front of the fence. June, are you okay? She did not respond. Junpei spun back around to face Ace. I'm sorry, I gotta go check on her. You do the box thing, alright? Hmm? Just put the cards in the boxes. I'm counting on you. He shoved the cards into Ace's hands and ran off toward June. Are you alright? What happened? Junpei called out to her as he ran. As he arrived, June was climbing to her feet with Santa's help. I'm sorry. I'm fine. I just tripped. Don't give me that. Now's not the time. But it's true. I tripped over a box. Junpei put his palm on her forehead. Her temperature was much the same as it had been the last time he'd checked. She, was, she wasn't hot like she'd been before, but she was still warm. Her fever wasn't completely gone. I saw her fall. I think she really did just trip on something, you know? Junpei would have been more willing to agree if Jun hadn't needed quite so much help standing up. Still, to fall down like that, I think she's probably still a little messed up. June was doing her best to busy herself brushing dust off her dress. Her smile looked a little embarrassed and her face was a bit flushed, but she did look a great deal better than she had. Still. Alright, well, let's get out of here as fast as we can so we can get you to a hospital. Oh, I don't think it's anything that serious. I just need a little medicine and some sleep and I'll be fine. Medicine. Medicine, huh? Well, if we could get in touch with anyone outside, I'll bet Ace could swing that for you easy. Ace? Why? Huh? Don't you know? He's the president of a pharmaceutical company. Cradle Pharmaceutical is the name, I think. Cradle Pharmaceuticals, huh? Now, where have I heard that name before? Go check out episodes 23 and 24 if you don't remember. The flagship product is an anesthetic drug called Soparil. 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 Junpei couldn't shake the feeling that he'd heard about Soparil before. Mm-hmm. Santa continued. Soparil. Soparil is an anesthetic that is gaseous at room temperature similar to nitrous oxide. It takes only a few seconds to spread and even a small amount is very effective. For these reasons, it found widespread acceptance with police and military forces in numerous countries. It was an effective crowd suppressant and room clearer, and is practical, ethical, and humane. Developed six years prior, it was made from the extracts of several different roots. It became popular almost as soon as it was made public, with many governments placing large orders. Demand for soap oil skyrocketed, and as it did, so did the stock of cradle pharmaceuticals. Why do you know all this? Santa's information was interesting, but Junpei couldn't help but feel a little suspicious. Santa's reply was blunt and simple. I heard it from the old man himself. From Ace? When? By the number four door at the central stairway, when we were searching the second classroom. Or second classroom, not second classroom. Completely different things. Remember how Snake 7 and you went to door 5? I asked him what he did for a living and he said he ran his own company. After that, we just started talking, and I guess it came up, you know? 
Are you worried about something? No, nothing. As he spoke, Junpei looked over toward Ace. He seemed to be having difficulty with the nine boxes. What the hell is he doing? He turned back to June and Santa. June, don't push yourself, all right? Yes. Santa, could you take care of her? Sure. He gave them both a short nod and then turned and headed toward Ace. What are you doing? Ace's back was to him as Junpei approached. The older man turned around to look at him. His face was pale and covered with sweat. What happened? Nothing. I... My vision has gotten rather blurry. I think perhaps because of fatigue. I can't see very well at the moment. What can't you see well? These pictures. Ace held out the cards to Junpei splayed out in the shape of a fan. I don't care to admit it, but I may be developing presbyopia. Growing old is a difficult thing. He made the best attempt he could at a self-deprecating smile, but his face was flushed and his lips were pale and drawn. At any rate, I'll leave the rest to you. I'm feeling awfully tired, so if you don't mind, I'd like to rest for a bit. He shoved the cards into Junpei's hands and walked quickly away. Junpei looked at him quizzically. How could simply looking at cards have tired him out? Junpei looked down at the cards in his hands. All of the pictures were quite, quite clear, and each person easily recognizable. Was Ace's vision truly so bad? But if it wasn't, what had made him so uncomfortable? That was when Junpei remembered what he'd heard from Lotus much earlier. Prosopagnosia. Well, put simply, it means a condition where the mind can't distinguish between human faces. In other words, my face would look like the same as Clover's or even yours. So they can't remember faces, which is how most people recognize each other. That means that people with prosopagnosia have trouble recognizing even people when they're close to. They're close to. Maybe... Maybe he's got prosopagnosia. Junpei took another look at Ace. He sat at the base of the stairs, looking quite depressed. It was reasonable, of course, that he'd feel that way. If he really did have prosopagnosia, there was no doubt it was depressing and it was a depressing and painful experience. Still, Junpei didn't feel like patting him on the shoulder and telling him everything would be alright would help that much. Still, Junpei felt perhaps it was the best to keep Ace's condition to himself, for at least the time being. Oh well. Doing his best to clear his mind for the task at hand, he turned back toward the boxes. It was time to solve the puzzle of the nine boxes. Nine cards with pictures and nine boxes. So that's very interesting. Before, in our previous run where we went through this, uh, June didn't uh, drop to the floor from her fever, or however she dropped to, her, to the floor. Uh, whether it be from tripping or from her fever, like I said. Uh, so we didn't actually give the cards over to Ace in that run-through. But this time around, when Ace is given the task, he can't do it, it seems. So prosopagnosia seems to be a pretty likely scenario. Also, I hope I'm not pronouncing prosopagnosia weird. Because I remember from the remake, it's like, prosopagnosia and so when I say it quickly it's like prosopagnosia the pag part the prosopagnosia I say that part kind of weird I just kind of cut it off okay I put in all of the pins in both of those places I know that I wouldn't have been able to commentate well if I didn't go ahead and cut there so I thought I might as well just save myself and you guys the trouble uh, not to say I'm any good at commentating normally, but, you know, I'd be even worse if I accident- if I actually tried to commentate while doing all that stuff. Now, let me see, I'm gonna try my best to see if I can actually do this puzzle from memory. Hey, I did it! 
I actually was competent at that, at that puzzle. For like the first time in my life. Holy crap. So now with that, we have come to the end of this puzzle room, and probably the end of this episode, so... I don't think there's any more changing dialogue after this. Unless... Someone wants to speak up and tell a story. Nope. We got the rusty key. It has opened. Alrighty, with that, we're going to end off this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye!